with one voice, we will sing. Every tribe and every tongue brings us harmony. With one voice, we will bring heaven's beautiful melodies down to this earth. children were little, sometimes as we prepared to serve the meals, they would say, what's for dinner? And I would say, well, mom has fixed a meal, but you have a choice. You have two choices, to be exact, for supper tonight. You can take it, or you can leave it. <laughs> now, my kids are grown. Our youngest is in college. But occasionally, we get a chance to have our grandchildren over. And last night was one of those opportunities. And last night, as dinner was being served, it wasn't about dinner, but we said, after you eat, you can go downstairs and watch a movie. And I said, you have, I have put on a movie, but you have two choices. You can either go downstairs and watch the movie, or you can take a bath and go to bed. It's your choice. But you have two choices. I believe in giving our children choices. Amen? Amen. Take it or leave it are two choices. Okay? Seriously. Today's sermon is entitled, You Have Two Choices. If you're using a smart phone or an iPad, in your bulletin is the sermon notes. You can scan it or you can type it in the website. There at the bottom there is a QR code and you can do that and you can pull up the sermon notes or you can do it old school. Pull out that sheet of paper and fill in the blanks. <clears throat> Whatever is good for you. but. If you would, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 15 through 18. I'm going to ask you to stand as God's Word is read today. Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. Father, I pray today that as we study your word, that your spirit would be our teacher and our guide here. That everything that I say would be from you and not from me. Father, that you would receive glory. But more than that, Father, that we would know what you would have us to know and do what you would have us to do as a result of your word being proclaimed. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> John the Baptist was preaching repentance of sins, and he was preaching about the preparation of the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ. And as people heard him preaching and proclaiming, some began to wonder if perhaps he was the Christ himself. But in these verses, we see that he very quickly set the record straight. <clears throat> he tells them that the Messiah, that first of all, that he was not the Messiah, but the Messiah was one who was coming not simply as a genie in a bottle to be able to grant them their every wish, but instead he will, he will come to baptize. And I did the research on these because I've heard others that say, 
that when, that when, that when Jesus baptized, he baptizes with the Spirit and with fire. <clears throat> but I believe that these are either or. You're either going to be baptized with the Spirit or you're going to be baptized with fire. If you look at, at verse 17 there, it says his winnowing fork is in his hand. Now, a winnowing fork is not something that most of us are, are familiar with. A winnowing fork was, was a tool that was used during the harvest time to, to pick up the wheat and throw it in the air. <clears throat> The heavier part of the grain would fall to the ground. The good part, the wheat itself, would fall to the ground. But the chaff, that is those outer kernels and, and, and uh, the roots and, and the stems, would all fly away. And they would fly to another place. And then this winnowing fork is used to gather up the chaff, that useless part. And it says that they put the chaff into the fire. <clears throat> so when, when John says that one is coming who will baptize with, with, with uh, the Holy Spirit and with fire, he then tells us what that fire is. The fire is not a good thing. When I was in the army, I had a guy that was a member of a church, and the, and the denomination was the Fire Baptized Holiness Church. Well, brother, I don't want to be baptized with fire. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be baptized with fire because the baptism here is utter and complete destruction. For those who repent and believe, He will baptize with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but for those who would refuse Him, He would baptize with fire. Jesus' message when He came and His purpose was quite simple. To gather the believers as wheat into the barn and to curse the unbeliever to everlasting fire. <clears throat> it is a simple question of heaven or hell. You have two choices. You have two choices. <clears throat> These are the only two options that Christ give us for eternity. Every preacher who's ever preached has preached the same truth. Life has many decisions. But eternity has only two decisions. <clears throat> to one of these two eternal destinations, every one of us is bound. We're either going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. Thank you, Brother Bernard. Not a trick question. And you've heard this before, then you already know the answer. But what is, somebody say it out loud, what is the death rate for humans? So far, the death rate for humans is 100%. Um, that's not a trick question. Everybody that is born dies. Amen? I don't know anybody that's like 10,000 years old. Cheated death again. <laughs> No. We know the minute that we take our first breath. Well, we don't cognitively know it then. But those that are around us know that the moment we take our first breath, that someday there will be an end date on our tombstone. Death is certain. And because of that, <clears throat> we have a choice to make while we're still able to make the choice. And that's my first point. It's your choice, but you must make a choice. <clears throat> you have to choose. <clears throat> Nobody can make this decision for you. Philippians 2.12 <clears throat> says this, that you need to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, before you get, um, before you get somehow misguided by this, don't be under any illusion that you work to be saved. Your works do not save you. <clears throat> but you will have to work out your salvation with God by yourself. In other words, your parents can't do it for you. Because your parents were faithful Christians, 
you are not automatically included in their decision to accept Jesus Christ. If your parents were the most heinous sinners, you are not destined to have. You have a choice. You personally have a choice to choose heaven or to choose hell. <coughs> you must make your choice. <clears throat> your choice is between two masters. This is the first point under that. It will either be Jesus Christ as your Lord, or it will be Satan. Matthew 6, 24 says you cannot serve both. It says no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We have to choose between our two masters. <clears throat> we also have to choose between two lives. Either the Christian life or the sinful life. James 3, verses 11 and 12 says, Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. We have to choose the life that we're going to live. It's either between the Christian life, living for Christ, or living for ourselves and living for the world. There really is no such thing as a worldly Christian. <clears throat> Worldly Christians are lost people. Matthew 7, 17 and 20 says, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. <clears throat> a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Does that sound familiar? Amen. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, God has told us not to judge. <coughs> We're not called to judge. God is our judge. <clears throat> but by God, we can be fruit inspectors. <laughs> if you tell me that you're a Christian, but your life doesn't reflect it, I'm going to assume otherwise. Now, I could be wrong. I'm not, I'm not omnipotent, and, I'm not, and I don't have infinite knowledge. But if you tell me you're a Christian, but your life doesn't reflect it, then chances are you've somewhere down the road been misguided or misled. <clears throat> you see, our decision is between two roads as well. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 talks about this. He says, enter through the narrow gate. <clears throat> For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to where? Destruction. Say it out loud. Destruction. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. <clears throat> and only a few find it. <clears throat> you see, there are a lot of people sitting in churches today. There are a lot of people sitting in churches today who think that this issue of their eternal security has been decided. But if you get down to the heart of the matter, and you ask them how they know that they're going to go to heaven, <coughs> you'd be amazed at the number of answers that they give. When I'm sharing the gospel with somebody, I have two questions that I asked at the beginning. Suppose you were to die tonight. Do you know for certain that you have eternal life and that you would go to heaven? If their answer is yes, <coughs> sorry, if their answer is yes, then I say, suppose you're standing before God right now, and he says, why should I let you into heaven? This separates the saved from the unsaved. Because if your answer is, well, I've tried to live a good life, I've always tried to treat people fairly, I've always tried to do the right thing, da-da-da-da-da, fill in the blank, then the answer is, that is the wrong answer. There's only... <laughs> you walk in your lane. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. <clears throat> There's only one answer, and that is the fact that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Okay? Now, let me, let me qualify that. 
Most, most people that say that say, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Come on now. But there's another word in there. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Right. Making Jesus my Savior is the easy part. Making Jesus my Lord isn't so easy. Right. Because that requires something on my part. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I have to do something to be saved. What you say, huh? Be careful here. I don't want you walking out of this place saying, Pastor Corm said, it's what I do that makes a difference of whether I'm saved or not. No, your salvation is determined by making Jesus your Savior. But you also need to make Him Lord of your life. And if you have no desire to make Him Lord of your life, then chances are you haven't made Him Savior either. It's kind of like that old song when I was a kid, Soup and Sandwich. Have one without the other. Okay? No, that's before your time, right? Sorry. Thanks. Give me this look like I never heard that before. They used to advertise that a lot during Lassie. <coughs> a few old people in here shuffling. Remember that? Remember that song? It goes together like a horse and carriage. Can't have one without the other. That's soup and sandwich. Come on, Campbell's is the one that created that song. Maybe Campbell's is the one that stole it. I don't know. <clears throat> but anyway, we have two choices. You have two choices. The last thing I want to, or the next to the last thing I want to say is that you have two choices between two deaths. Either the death of the righteous or the death of the wicked. And the Bible has very clear things to say about the two of these. Let's look at Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord, it says, is the death of His saints. This is the death of the righteous. But look at what Ezekiel 33, in verse 11 says. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You see, we have a choice. You have a choice. You have two choices. You can choose the death of the righteous or the death of the wicked. And like I said before then, you have a choice between two destinies. You can either choose heaven or hell. But you have a choice. Now, ironically, your choice covers three realms. <clears throat> your choice covers three realms. The first one of these is the one that you're in now, if you're in the sound of my voice, and that is the realm of life. The realm of life is the dressing room for eternity. This is the place that you prepare for eternity. This is the time to get it right. This is your opportunity to make sure that you've done what you need to do to prepare for the life that is to come after this life is over. The first realm is the realm of life. The second realm is the realm of death. The Bible says it is appointed once for man once to die, and then comes the judgment. The realm of death is the appointment <clears throat> that all of us have in this world today. Unless the Lord returns, all of us are going to meet, make this appointment. As we said before, the death rate for humans is 100%. But then there's a third realm that we will also face, and that is the realm of eternity. <clears throat> Now, here's the good news, sort of. All of us, every single one of the people in here, will have eternal life. That's the good news. <clears throat> Preach it. The bad news is smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> You have a choice. You have two choices. The realm of eternity is going to last forever. That's 
what the word eternity means. It means forever. There is no end. It's, you're going to serve it either in heaven or in hell. Eternal reward or eternal punishment. The third point I want to make, and the most important, is that your choice will determine your destiny. The answer to the question, what will you do with Jesus, will determine your eternal destiny. <clears throat> there is nothing else on earth that will determine your destiny but your answer to that question. Listen, it's not determined by riches. You can't buy your way into heaven. And you cannot be too rich to go to heaven. Riches are irrelevant at the foot of the cross. God doesn't look at you and say, oh, you were successful in life. Enter into your reward. You are a great businessman or woman, and therefore I'm going to let you in because you made a lot of money. God really doesn't care. The story goes about a man that's, that's creating a ruckus <coughs> at, at the gates of heaven. And St. Peter comes to the Lord and he says, Lord, we've got a problem with one of the guys at the gate. And, and, and the Lord says, what's the problem? And he says, he's got, a, he's got a wheelbarrow full of gold bullion and he wants to bring it in when he comes. And God said, why would anybody in the world want to bring pavement to heaven? <laughs> the Bible says the streets, the streets of heaven are paved with gold. You see, gold doesn't impress God. Gold doesn't matter to God. <clears throat> it, does not, it is not determined by your riches. It is not determined by your education. In fact, sometimes education gets in the way of salvation. Amen. There are some people in the world that are too smart for their britches, like my grandmother used to say, <clears throat> or too big for their britches. There are many wise men in the world who are fools when it comes to eternal things. But you see, the way of salvation isn't hard or difficult. In fact, the way of salvation is simple. Isaiah 35 8 says, And a highway will be there, and it will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. It's not determined by how much book smarts you have. It's also not determined by religion. <clears throat> In fact, the people that gave Jesus the most trouble and whom Jesus spoke out against the most were the religious people of his day. Religion doesn't save anybody. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. It doesn't happen. It's not determined by religions. Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says this. Listen, this, this is a sad, sad verse. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. <clears throat> Baptist who have never been saved go to the same hell that unsaved Mormons, Muslims, Buddhists, Presbyterians, Methodists, and anybody else that you can name. It doesn't matter what your religion is. God really doesn't care about your religion. In fact, religion often gets in the way of salvation because we, we figure out if, if we can just be religious, then that's good enough. And so we work hard at being religious and we speak religious words and we, we attend religious events and we put religious slogans on our Facebook page. But if our heart is far from God, then we're going through the motions and we're not real and your salvation is not yes, genuine. Yes, yes, Tell it anyway. Yes, yes, say that. Say it again. It's not determined by your religion. It's also not determined by your social standing. Listen, you can have a thousand friends on Facebook. 
but it's not going to get you to heaven. Your, your social standing has nothing to do. You can be on top of the world and spend forever in the pit of hell. What? You see, all ground is level. All ground is level. All ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all stand at the foot of the cross as sinners in need of a Savior. And in case you missed it, it's not determined by your works. Your eternal destination is not determined by the things that you do for Jesus. Your eternal destination is not determined by the things you do for Jesus. Your eternal destination is determined by what you do with Jesus. This and this alone decides your eternal destination. John 3.18 says this, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Listen. You cannot ride the fence on this one. I said at the beginning, you have two choices. And you say, well, I'm just not going to choose. Then guess what? By not choosing, you have chosen. Yes, yes. This verse right here speaks to that. If you do not believe, if you say, I choose not to believe, then you stand condemned already because you have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You see, what you do with Jesus makes all the difference in the world. 1 John 5.12 says this, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's a simple choice. It's just like I told my kids. Take it or leave it. It's your choice. If you receive Jesus in your heart by faith, you are heaven bound. If you have not, there's nothing else that will save your soul. There are only two options. Take it or leave it. And the only way to decide on them is to answer this question. What will you do with Jesus? Your answer <coughs> makes all the difference in the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. With one voice, we will sing every tribe and every